Our text this afternoon from God's Holy Word is the, the Seventh Commandment, You Shall Not Commit Adultery. In connection with that Word of God, we, will, we confess in the Heidelberg Catechism, with, Lord, with, with Lord's Day 41, uh, the, the following. So if you want to follow along in Lord's Day 41, you can find it on page 556 in your Book of Praise. The Catechism here is going through the, the Ten Commandments as a rule of thankfulness, for the salvation and redemption that the Lord Jesus Christ has given to us. And we confess the following. First of all, in question and answer 108, what does the seventh commandment teach us? And the answer is that all unchastity is cursed by God. We must therefore detest it from the heart and live chaste and disciplined lives both within and outside of holy marriage. Question answer 109, does God in, his, in this commandment forbid nothing more than adultery and similar shameful sins? And the answer is, since we body and soul are temples of the Holy Spirit, it is God's will that we keep ourselves pure and holy. And therefore, he forbids all unchaste acts, gestures, words, thoughts, desires, and whatever may entice us to unchastity. congregation of our Lord Jesus Christ. <clears throat> Last time we dealt with Lord's Day, or the previous Lord's Day, we dealt with the sixth commandment, and there we saw the Lord God protects the life of all mankind when he commands us, you shall not murder. Now we come this afternoon to the seventh commandment, and you can say in the seventh commandment, the Lord God protects our marriages when he says, you shall not commit adultery. So in this commandment, the Lord God is concerned that as husbands and wives, we remain faithful to one another. That we continue to love one another and genuinely care for one another our entire life. Now, it's interesting that when the Jews thought about, the old, about this commandment in the Old Testament, they stressed the fact uh, that when you committed adultery, you were marrying a woman that belonged to a, another man. So you, you were actually stealing property that belonged to your neighbor. Remember in the Tenth Commandment, the Lord warns, about coveting, and he says, you shall not covet your neighbor's wife. So there, he, God is indeed clearly focused on the fact that you should not commit adultery with another woman who belongs to another man, for he's not, she is not your property, she, is, she belongs to another, another man. But when we come to the New Testament, the Lord Jesus makes very clear that this law deals with much more than the marriage relationship. For God forbids all sexual relationships that are outside of marriage. Sexual relations outside of marriage are, of course, also forbidden already in the Old Testament. But what you notice in the Old Testament is that God prescribes different penalties for different kinds of situations with regard to sexual sins in Israel. Anybody who committed adultery, that is, a married person with another married person, those two who had committed uh, adultery were to be stoned to death. On the other hand, those who had sexual relations but were not married, they either had to pay money to the father of the woman or the man had to marry the woman and he could not divorce her. But when we come to the New Testament, we see that there's no longer a distinction made with regard to those different kinds of penalties and those different kinds of situations. Why? Because the Lord Jesus makes it very clear that all sexual sins will be judged by God because they're equally deserving of God's eternal judgment and God's eternal punishment. And while indeed forgiveness can be sought when there are sexual sins and they can even, forgiveness can even be given, yet it needs to be understood that any sin of a sexual nature, whether you're married or not married, it is forbidden by the Lord our God. So Jesus warns us against the lust of the flesh. 
and he warns us about its destructive nature. And so the Lord Jesus also in the New Testament times continues to, to protect the marriage relationship of his people in the New Testament church. And that is as necessary as, as ever. When we look around us today, we live in a time when divorce and adultery are, are rampant in our society. And that means that this commandment can also be difficult for many in our society and perhaps even within the church for God's people to, to hear, to listen to. This commandment may even seem as if God is condemning everyone in society who is divorced. But we need to remember here, beloved, is that God's commandments, indeed, it has universal value, and all those in all society who, uh, who obey this commandment will also be blessed as a result of it. Yet these commandments are given by God to his people, to his church, that is, to those who have sought him in faith. As I was thinking through this, it reminded me many years ago, my previous congregation, a young lady came to the worship service, and she had been divorced. And uh, this is the first time that she attended one of the worship services in our church, and that particular Sunday, I was preaching on the text we read from Malachi, which God warns against the divorce. Well, by the grace of God, it didn't keep her away from the church. She continued to come and she continued to worship. Although she did tell me uh, later on, as we were working through instruction, that indeed that Sunday was a difficult Sunday for her. But what was clear is that she, didn't, she was not driven, driven away on account of that message. Because she also heard this. She also heard that the message that in the church, marriage is valued. And in the church, marriage is being protected. And so as God's people, we're thankful that, that the Lord cares enough for us. That he also graciously protects our marriage relationships by giving to us this command that you shall not commit uh, adultery. But we also need to understand, beloved, that the commandment by itself is not enough. Paul himself says, you know, the commandments only create even, even worse things in us as it teaches, as it shows us what, what is sinful, and we seem to pursue that sin even, even more. And so when we deal with this commandment, we must also understand the motivation that lies behind this commandment if we are indeed to, to protect our marriages. For if your heart is not right, right, if your heart is not right with the Lord your God, then this commandment is of no value, and you will not be able to keep this commandment either in your marriage relationships. And so this afternoon, we'll listen to God's word under this theme, you shall not commit adultery. And then we'll look especially at the fact that this shows us God's gracious protection of marriage. So you shall not commit adultery. We see that God, we look here at God's gracious protection of our, of our marriages. We look at three things. First of all, we see that God is the one who gives marriage. Secondly, that God demands loyalty. And, and thirdly, that God warns about sexuality. That means a wrong view of sexuality. No mankind generally can agree that the sixth commandment, you shall not murder, is a good commandment. We shouldn't kill one another. We shouldn't kill uh, other people. But our society today has great difficulty with the seventh commandment, in which God says you shall not commit uh, adultery. So people feel, indeed, innately, that it is wrong to take another person's life. But they will ask the question today, but what's wrong if two consenting adults, even if they might have, uh, even if they might be married, have sexual relations, what's so wrong with that? And they might say, oh, yeah, we know it hurts maybe the other spouse, but really what's the big deal? So the question is even being asked in our society today, is this commandment really realistic? You shall not commit adultery. Right, we can look back to the very beginning of the world and we can say, you know, the adultery has been there almost from the very beginning. 
Can we really expect people not to follow the sexual desires of their own heart? Or we take it a step further, is it even realistic to expect two people to be faithful to each other for their whole life to the day that they die? Or people ask the question this way, isn't it better for a couple who do not love each other anymore to find somebody else that they love rather than to continue in a loveless relationship? So you notice all those kinds of human questions and reasons are being used to, to undermine the whole institution of marriage as God has given it to us in the very beginning. And when we see the sexual morality all around us, it is so easy to see why people raise these kind of questions. And while our society is indeed saturated with sexuality, we should keep in mind that the moral climate it wasn't a whole lot different in the days of the Roman Empire and when the Apostle Paul uh, and when the other apostles were bringing the gospel uh, to, to the world. And if you go back even further, you go back to the Old Testament times, how often does God not have to warn his people because of the sexual immorality that he sees among his people, Israel? And so what you see here, beloved, is that this commandment is rowing against the moral tide of this world that has already from the beginning, and it continues to do so even today. So why? Why does God insist that his people row against this tide of immorality? Well, in order to answer that question, we need to go back, and we need to understand what marriage really is. Remember God in the very beginning created uh, Adam and Eve, man and woman, for each other so that they could enjoy a marriage relationship. And after God created Adam, the man, uh, God then, we read in Genesis chapter 2, God said, you know, it's not good for the man to be alone. I will make a helper suitable for him. And then he, you remember, he made the woman Eve from the rib of the man. And he gave her to the man Adam, and they became one flesh. So first of all, then, what we see here is in the very beginning, God instituted the marriage relationship. It's simply the way in which God created man and woman. And when God made man, he did not make Adam. When he made Adam in the beginning, he did not make Adam as a self-sufficient man. We didn't have any need for anyone or anything else. No, he made him... But he made him in a way that he had a need for somebody else. Somebody who yet was just like him and yet who was different than him. That is somebody who was able to compliment him. And so when God says that he will make the woman a helper suitable for the man. What we need to understand here, beloved, is God did not create the woman to be inferior to the man. He didn't create the woman so that she could just be a, a, a servant to the man and, and the man could just give his commands to the woman and say to the woman, says, do this and do that and do this for me. That's not why God created and gave Adam or the man the woman. No, the man was alone. But that was an impossible situation for the man because he was not self-sufficient. God created him in such a way that he couldn't live on his own, but he needed a companion in order to deal with his loneliness. The woman, you can say, was necessary to complete the man so that together they were able to fulfill the calling and to, fill, to fulfill the work that God had given them to do in this world. And so they are to, to assist each other, and they are called to, to work together in harmony. You hear Adam's joy expressed uh, when he sings, you can say, the very first love song in the world. In Genesis 2, verse 23, there he sings these words. He says, this is not bone of my bones, referring to the woman Eve that God had given to him. This is not bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman, for she was taken out of the man. So there is this incredible joy for Adam in, it, in that God has provided for his loneliness. So that he doesn't need to carry out his, his work all alone anymore. We can say that God instituted marriage in the beginning. 
And therefore, God also protects marriage uh, through this law. But we need to understand a little more about the relationship between a husband and wife. It's not enough for us to understand what the relationship is really like. See, God reveals his great pleasure with the people of Israel in, in the days of the prophet Malachi. We read together part of the prophecy of Malachi. The people in the days of Malachi lived about, you know, about four or five hundred years before the coming of the Lord Jesus. But the people realized in those days that, that God was no longer accepting the sacrifices he was bringing to them in the temple. And when they began to, to realize that God wasn't pleased with the sacrifices he was giving to them, what did they do? Well, Malachi says, you know, you flooded the altar in the temple. You flooded the altar with your tears. You wept and you wailed because God would not accept your sacrifices. But they don't understand. They said, God, what more can we do? Look, at we brought all of these gifts to you, yet they're not good enough for you. Why, Lord, are you so angry with us? And the Lord replies. And God says, it's because I am the witness between you and the wife of your youth. You have been unfaithful to her. Though she, is, though she is your partner, the wife of your marriage covenant. You see, marriage is not just about two people who decide it's maybe a nice thing that we should live together. What's clear here is that when a couple gets married, they're entering into a marriage covenant. When you make a covenant with someone, a covenant simply means that you enter into an agreement. But the agreement that you enter into is more than just a business agreement you might enter into with somebody when you make a business transaction. It's more than just a business transaction. Because in a covenant, what you do is you make solemn promises. You're making a vow to each other. And you're making those vows to each other, a husband and wife, before the Lord God in heaven who is witnessing to the vows, the promises that you make to one another. And in the marriage vow, a man and a woman make a solemn promise that they will love each other, that they will care for each other, and that they will protect each other for the rest of their life. And there are no exceptions. Right? There are no exception clauses in the marriage covenant. These are promises that we make all the days of our life, whether it be good days or whether they might be difficult and bad days. Now, one might object. You might say, well, minister, that's a pretty tall order for anybody to keep who can do that. Can a man and a woman really keep such promises for their whole life. Isn't the reality that, that couples often fall out of love with each, with each other? Wouldn't it be better that they just divorce in, in those kinds of cases? Well, you notice that is human reasoning that's based on the sinful inclinations of our human nature. But what God do? When God comes and he calls us to be his people, God also demands something better from us as his people. God comes to us and he can make such a demand on the basis of the covenant that he has made with us and the covenant bond that he has made with us as his people. For we need to keep in mind that the marriage covenant reflects the covenant that God makes with us as his people. You see, when God comes to us, he, he doesn't just say, oh, well, let's go and let's just live together, and then we'll see how it goes. That's not what God does. Right? When he calls us, he, he calls us to enter into a covenant with him, in which, which is a covenant which is, lasting, which is to last forever. In the Old Testament, when God made a covenant with Israel, what did he do? Well, he gave them the sign of circumcision of that covenant. In the New Testament, God has given to us baptism as, as a sign of that covenant in which he has entered into a relationship with us as his people. So baptism, you could say, is a sign in which 
God says, I will be the Lord your God, I will be your Father, and you will be my people forever. Forever. And so whenever God enters into a covenant, which he says, I will be your God and you will be my people, it is an eternal covenant. And in this covenant relationship, the Lord God demands from us. He says, I will be faithful to you, but also demand from you that you always, always are faithful to me. Well, that covenant relationship with God, beloved, is, you can say, the source of our greatest joy. Right, our almighty God, the God who loves us so dearly. Yes, he loves us so dearly that he sent his only son, Jesus Christ, so that he might purchase us, he might buy us with his shed blood on the cross. His love, his faithfulness will abide forever. If he has indeed given his very own life for us, will he then not always then also love us? And will he not always care for us? And in response, do we not then respond in, in, in love? Do we not then also discover that, that newfound love in which we desire to be faithful to the Lord our God forever? And so if God is faithful to his vows, then the power, then by the power of the Spirit, I may also uh, seek to be faithful to the Lord my God. And when you're faithful, and when you experience that, that faithful relationship with God, and when you enjoy that relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ as your Savior, then the Lord will also give you, beloved, the strength that you need to be faithful to the wife of your youth. As children of God, purchased by the blood of Jesus, we're called. We're called to be faithful to every single word, every single promise that we make. That means that we then also desire in our heart that we want to be faithful to our husband. We want to be faithful to our wife. Oh, it doesn't mean it's always going to be easy. But we want to be faithful. Because we want to be faithful to the love of our God. We are faithful to our spouse, both in those good days and those days of troubles, those bad days. Together we're able to help each other. Together we want to face the challenges that God pre presents in our lives. Together we want to work as husband and wife for the kingdom and for the glory of our God. And therefore, we'll see in the second place that God demands loyalty in our marriage relationship. See, God detests those who are unfaithful uh, to their marriage vows. For God is compassionate God. And when he looks down and he, and he sees us, he sees the incredible pain. And he sees the awful trouble such a person brings into the life of his or her spouse and family when they're unfaithful to their vows. So that's what God says here in Malachi 2 or 16. He says there, he says, the man who hates and divorces his wife does violence, does violence to the one he should protect. So be on guard and do not be unfaithful. You see, in the Old Testament, it was the man, the husband, who has the right, who had the right to divorce his wife. In Leviticus 24, one states this, that if man marries a woman and the woman becomes displeasing to him because he finds something indecent in her, doesn't spell out what that indecent is, then he writes her a bill of divorce. But on the other hand, if a man commits adultery with another woman, then he, together with the woman with whom he commits adultery, is to be stoned to death. So you notice then in that case where a, a husband or a woman who is stoned to, to, to death, there's no need for the woman anymore to divorce her husband because her husband is dead. When we come to the, the New Testament church, we know in the New Testament church, the adulterer is no longer stoned, no longer put to death. And therefore, Jesus says that no one is, indeed, no one is to divorce his wife, or no one is to divorce her husband, except, except for sexual immorality, that is adultery. 
You see what Jesus is doing here? In the Old Testament, a wife was freed from her husband because her husband was, was stoned to death if he committed adultery. But since a, an adulterer in the New Testament is no longer put to, to death in the New Testament church, uh, then she, or it can also be he, is no longer bound to the marriage vows. So then we need to ask, so, so what really is the situation we're dealing with here in, in, in Malachi, and how does that affect, impact our situation, our situation today? You see, these men are not committing adultery in the classic sense uh, of uh, being unfaithful to their vows and laying with a woman outside of marriage. Now, what they're doing is this. They are writing certificates of divorce according to Leviticus 24 to their wives, to the wives of their youth. And why are they writing those certificates of divorce? So that they can be free to marry foreign wives who seem to be so much more attractive to them. And God sees what is happening, and God is angry with them, for they're breaking their marriage covenant with their wives. And then God concludes in verse 16, he says, what you're doing is you're, you're doing violence to the one that you should be protecting. Actually, literally, uh, he says something else. There's an expression that in our translation is kind of... Um, put into the sense of you're doing violence against the one you should be protecting. But the literal uh, expression here is they cover their garments with violence. They cover their garments with violence. Uh, it's an expression that would have been understood in the back in, 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 in the days of Israel for it would often be the practice for a man to spread a garment, right? A piece of clothing over the woman that he wanted to, uh, to marry. You think of Boaz doing that with, with Ruth, right? In the, in the story about Ruth. So the garment, today we might often think of it in terms of the marriage bed. And we'll talk about defiling the marriage bed when somebody commits adultery. Or we could say here, and express it in our modern English, we could say such a man covers the marriage bed with violence. So God sees what divorce does. And God says, I see that it violently destroys the marriage relationship. Because imagine that, that you make a lifetime vow to someone. And when you make a lifetime vow in your marriage day, you look up to your husband or you look up to your wife to, to love you and to care for you and, and to protect you. And then one day your spouse comes and says to you, I'm no longer going to keep my vows to you. Imagine what that does. Perhaps some of you have experienced it. But what it does... It rips the relationship apart. Rips it apart in such a way that it's even worse than any violence can do. So your person is totally violated. Everything that you count on in your relationship, the support, the care, the protection, is suddenly pulled away, ripped away from you. And God, God's above. And God sees the pain. God sees the devastation that it is bringing into the lives of these wives here in Israel. But beloved, this, this attitude reflects a more troubling attitude there in the hearts of those men in Israel. In Jeremiah chapter 2 verse 2, God says to Israel, He says, I remember the devotion of your youth. How is a bride you loved me and you followed me through the wilderness. So what God does here in Jeremiah is he fondly remembers those days when his people Israel were like a bride to the Lord God, a bride who, who left, that God took out of Egypt and he led them through the wilderness and they followed the Lord God as their bridegroom. And there Israel were, they were loyal to God and, and there in the wilderness God protected them and he gave them finally the promised land gave them everything that would give them joy and happiness and security and stability in their lives. And now many centuries later, in the, time, in the days of the prophet Malachi, God sees that the people of Israel are no longer loyal to, the, uh, to him. And he sees how their unfaithfulness is now clearly reflected in their unfaithfulness to their wives. You know, from our, our perspective today, we know the Lord Jesus 
to be our bridegroom. We are our heavenly bridegroom who has laid down his life for us on the cross. When we look to the Lord Jesus in faith, we look up to him as the one who is faithful. We know that he is always loyal to us. Right in Christ, we experience his love and his protection. And that's why we follow the Lord Jesus as a loving bride. There's no one that we, whom we would love more to follow than him. We want to be loyal to Christ. Because we desire to live under his loving care all the days of our life. And if we turn away from his loving care, then we destroy the relationship that we have with him. That, beloved, is going to have awful consequences because that means that the wrath of God will also be turned against you. Right? When we turn against Christ, then the wrath of God comes against us. But if we truly love Christ as he loved us, then in his love, we don't only want to love Christ, but we want to reflect the love of Christ in our love for our spouse. You know, our Lord Jesus, he loves us. In spite of our many weaknesses. Christ's love is a love that never wavers. And as we desire to, to love Christ, so we must also desire to remain loyal to, our, to the wife of our youth and to love her or to love him. You think of our husbands. As Christ is faithful to the promises he makes to us, we want to be faithful to our promises to the one that we love in marriage. And oh, we, we see the weaknesses of our spouse. Right? We seek our, see our spouse's weaknesses better than anyone else does. This is Christ. He sees the weaknesses in our lives. And yet, our heart must still go out to our spouse. We continue to, to love our husband, continue to love our wife. As Christ has so wonderfully loved us, in spite of my sins, in spite of my weaknesses. Oh, I know that in my marriage relationship, I cannot attain the greatness of Christ's love. But beloved, by faith, we do desire, desire to reflect something of his love also in our marriage relationships. And finally, we need to take a heed to God's warning concerning sexuality. You see, there are two things that God constantly warns about in the scriptures. First of all, he warns about materialism, goods, financials, money. And secondly, he warns against sexuality. Those are, are the two things that seem to constantly captivate the heart of mankind and continually lead us astray. Money and sex, you can say, are the two idols that people worship as if they're the things that will give to us mankind, give us our greatest joy and our pleasure. It will give us the security and the stability that we seek in our lives. But the reality is just the opposite. They cannot give us security and stability. They do not even give us lasting pleasure. They might give us pleasure for a fleeting moment. And every time we left, seek again, that fleeting moment of pleasure is gone again. Today, we live in a world that is awash with sexuality. It's what consumes the heart of mankind. Perhaps you may recall seeing in the papers and social media around the time that you have the different Hollywood award ceremonies for the stars music stars, or whether it be movie stars, or TV stars, or whatever it may be. What do you see in the newspapers? You see in the social media, they are full of pictures of women walking down the red carpet of those ceremonies. Not all of the women, but many of the women are dressed in provocative sexual ways. Just trying to make a statement. Trying to attract the, potential, the attention of others in those ways. Or you have the porn industry. You realize that the pornography industry is the largest industry in the whole world. That more money is spent on pornography than anything else, any other industry in the entire globe. 
So does God's warning against sexuality, does that mean that it's wrong to have sexual desires in your heart? Well, no. For in fact, our sexuality, beloved, is a gift from God to be enjoyed by God's people. Paul writes in 1 Corinthians 7 verse 9 about marriage, and he says if somebody cannot control their sexual desires, he says they should marry, for it is better to marry than to burn with passion. God, Paul makes two things clear here. First of all, that sexual desires themselves are not evil and are not wrong. But such passions need to be controlled so that they are used in the proper way. They are used only in marriage. Paul understands that sexuality is a very powerful desire. And therefore, we need to deal with it very carefully. And we need to handle it with great respect. You see, in the beginning, God created man and women as sexual beings with sexual desires. It was their sexual desires that brought Adam and Eve together and desiring for one another and wanting to, to live together as husband and wife. And then that continues to be the way that adult men and adult women also become attracted to each other today. Think of the Song of Songs. Remember the Song of Songs reveals the attraction between a man and a woman. The song itself, it begins with the woman. The woman declaring her desire for the man whom she loves. And she expresses sexual longing for the one that she loves when she says, Let him kiss me with the kisses of his mouth. For your love is more delightful than wine. And then later in the song, the couple will speak about their sexual longing when they describe also their physical attributes of one another in glowing terms. See, God makes clear that he has given sexuality as a wonderful blessing. But a blessing that is only to be experienced and to be enjoyed in the marriage relationship between a husband and a wife. But you see, the problem is that when sin entered into the world, all our good desires became corrupted, defiled by sin. When mankind is, is, is without sin, when mankind is perfect, we'll know how to use this gift in a proper way. We'll use it to, to show our love for our spouse and we'll not have any other desires or any other attractions outside of the relationship we have with our spouse because that is perfect and that is good and we know everything else isn't good and isn't perfect and is only something that's warped. But the problem is that sin takes hold of this powerful emotion. And it warps us in such a way that we think that, that we can get more of it by going outside of the marriage relationship. Or we can get more of it by be living however we want. But it warps our life into something that is twisted and heinous. And that's why the Lord God also commands in the 10th commandment, he says, you shall not covet your neighbor's wife. Here, God already in the, in, the, in the Tenth Commandment reveals the very depth of this command. God doesn't just warn us not to commit adultery. But he says, I warn you, do not even entertain the very thought of adultery there in your heart. And the Lord Jesus picks up on that in Matthew chapter 5, verse 28, which we read together. When he says, anyone who looks at a woman lustfully has already committed adultery with her in his heart. You know, a lot of people today, when they read these words of the Lord Jesus, they think Jesus' words are ridiculous. Don't believe him. What's the wrong to be sexually attracted to other people? What's wrong with exploring your sexuality? After all, we are sexual beings, aren't we? You know, when I was still a youth, pornography was outlawed in our society. But slowly, the boundaries so what was permissible became greater till today. It has become normal for people to simply seek their entertainment by it. And so people ask, so what is so bad about it if it's just a fantasy that you have in your mind? What can be so wrong about that? You're not hurting anybody. Well, beloved, the Lord Jesus knows that the sinful lust in the heart destroys relationships if it is not carefully 
controlled. A man's desire is to be for his wife and only for his wife. And the wife's desire is to be for her husband and only her husband. You see, there cannot be competing desires without it affecting the marriage relationship. It's as simple as that. What happens with pornography is that people become dissatisfied with their spouse for there's always a picture of somebody who is more desirable, somebody who seems to be more delicious. And when there are those competing desires in your heart, it affects the intimacy in your marriage relationship. And it reveals a lack of honor and respect for your husband and for your wife. You see here too, we, we need to understand the deeper issue with regard to our relationship with the Lord Jesus as our bridegroom. As our bridegroom, the Lord Jesus is not going to tolerate, and we understand that, beloved, he's not going to tolerate competing claims there on your heart. The desire of your heart is to be for the Lord Jesus and for the Lord Jesus alone. The Lord does not want a, just a part of you. He doesn't want just a part of your heart. No, he demands that you give him your whole heart. Why? Because he is the one who has given his whole heart. In fact, he gave his whole life for you when he died on the cross. He didn't just give a part of himself. He gave all of himself for us. And so he asks and he demands from us that we give him all of ourselves to him. But beloved, when you give your heart to other idols, when you make pornography or sexuality the God in your life, understand what you're doing. You're destroying your intimacy with Jesus Christ. Intimacy means referring to that closeness, a close relationship in which you know you're loved by him and you love him. And when you let other competing idols in there, it destroys that intimacy. And as no marriage relationship can withstand the intrusion of someone else into the relationship, so your relationship with Christ cannot withstand the intrusion of another idol or another God in your life. And therefore, in the Lord Jesus Christ, we want to, we seek with all heart that we might put away all idolatry. We seek to put aside the sinful sexual desires that we know will destroy our relationship with the Lord Jesus and that, ultimately also, and that will also destroy our relationship with our spouse. And that's why in faith we look to the Lord Jesus, Lord, give me the strength that I might also use the sexuality that you have given to me as a wonderful gift, that I may use it to serve you and I might serve my spouse in my marriage relationship. And as Christ was faithful, and as Christ loved me, now, beloved, we desire to be faithful, and we desire to love our spouse. And when we serve each other in marriage with the love that Christ has shown to us, well, then you may also expect to enjoy wonderful blessings in your relationship and in your marriages. Amen.